All right, you can turn in your King James Bible to the book of Amos, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. I'll give you kind of an interesting theory today on the timing of the catching away of the body of Christ and how it's going to relate to these two verses here in Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. It's kind of an interesting study. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now, I myself personally have preached this thing for a while, that this famine is going on right now. We are in the falling away. Um, mentioned Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be getting over in that area here in a little bit. But there certainly has come a time period here in professing Christianity where people are doing things today that no Christian would have done in the past. Uh, there is no such thing as progressive Christianity. Right? You have to understand that. The purity of the purest time for the Christian church is the first century. And since that time, things have been going downhill. Things are not getting better. The only thing that has improved in all of church history is the publication of God's Word being made available to us in a one-volume book that's printed, and specifically so with the King James Bible. Um, there has never been a time in history when a complete volume has existed of Hebrew Old Testament, Greek New Testament in one volume uh, that are exactly reprints of the original autographs. That time has never existed. What we have is the, the trans, transmission of Scripture down onto the, the English world, basically. Um, basically, you had the received text, the, the vast majority of manuscripts, over 99% of all extant Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, that text type uh, was really brought back into play in the early 1500s, the early 16th century. Uh, Desiderius Erasmus was the one who started to compile these manuscripts and made a text, a Greek and Latin text, together. And that text later became known, uh, probably over a century, yeah, actually over a century later, as the received text, the Textus Receptus, all right? That's the text that underlies this King James Bible. So back where in Erasmus's day, in the early 16th century, you had Martin Luther producing the Heilige Schrift, the Holy Scriptures, in other words, in German, and you had William Tyndale producing his translation of the New Testament, and he began the Old Testament translation. He was captured by the Catholics who were forbidding the Scriptures in the common what they called vulgar tongue, not meaning that they were using profanity, but the vulgar in that time period meant common. And you had William Tyndale trying to get the whole Bible done. They caught him because he was a fugitive from their system. Um, William Tyndale, if you don't know who he is, he was a Catholic priest at one point in time. He turned against Catholicism because he started to study the Scriptures. And anybody that studies the Scriptures is going to see that Roman Catholicism has no basis in the Bible, any Bible, including their own Bible. You're not going to see the Pope, you're not going to see Catholic, you're not going to see nuns, you're not going to see monks or sacraments or the Eucharist or anything else like that. You're not going to see those. Those are foreign to the pages of Scripture. Again, any Bible. Um, but you had Martin Luther taking Erasmus's text and making the Holy Scriptures for the German people. William Tyndale attempted to, to do it for the English-speaking world but he was captured and executed before he could complete the Old Testament. And then there's a, uh, a number of attempts to make a translation of these received text manuscripts. And, of course, the received text, as they're finding more and more and more Greek manuscripts, more men, Stephanus, and, and you know, I forget some of the other guys, but they were coming out with updatings of Erasmus's original work. And they transmitted the text up until the point where the Puritans and the Church of England came together and they said to the king and they petitioned the king, King James uh, I of England and the sixth of Scotland, I think, if my memory serves me correctly. And they came to him and they said, can you please authorize a translation of scripture? 
give us royal protection so that we can bring out a really superior translation. And every word of the King James Bible had to pass seven tests before it was accepted. And, um, you know, it, it just tremendous, the translation, you know, of 54 men, of, of 54 of England's greatest uh, scholars at the time. Later on, it was 47 because some of the men died. It was, took seven years to make this King James Bible. And so, uh, 1604 to 1611, the authorized version of 1611, today known as the King James Version. Um, that's the story of it. 1881, uh, they were saying about, should we revise the King James Bible? Should we, should we kind of do a revision to update some of the language and whatever else? And two lost men, um, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, two professors, I think one was Cambridge, one was Oxford over in England, and they, instead of saying, let's take the Texas Receptus and kind of go and look at things, they introduced a new Greek text um, to the revision committee, um, and they, it was not received text manuscripts, it was actually a minority text that goes back to Alexandria, Egypt. And they brought in, they introduced this text, uh, the biggest, two biggest manuscripts that underlie this, less than 1%, are uh, codices, that's a name for a Greek, you know, codex, uh, is a sort of a book of manuscripts, Codices B and Aleph. B is also known as Vaticanus. Aleph is also known as Sinaiticus or Sinaiticus, or there's different ways people can say that. But it's important to understand Vaticanus came from the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican. They are the ones that have the sole authority and the sole rights to the, the B Codex, the Vaticanus Codex. So since 1881, this revised version, they introduced a completely new text, not the time-honored majority Textus Receptus. They brought in their own new text from the Vatican, and since 1881, the revised version of 1881, then the American Standard Version of 1901, and then every version since then has been based on this minority text from the Vatican. That's the basic Bible version issue. There's a lot of other things that you can get into. But my whole point is, the Bible says that there's going to come a point in time when God is going to send a famine. Okay, notice that from our text here. Amos chapter 8, verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, it's God saying this, that I will send a famine in the land. All right? God sends the famine. And as we saw, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People aren't going to be hearing the words of the Lord. Now, is that true right now? No, it's not. You can get online and you can look up in within five minutes. All you got to do, type in King James Bible, King James preaching, word, preaching from the Word of God or whatever else, and you can find a wealth of information. We're not in the famine right now. And, you know, I have said that there is a famine because of all these new versions that are that are being put into churches and put into Christian circles. They're Vatican corruptions of the true time-honored text of the King James Bible. And they are, certainly they are. But the King James Bible preaching is still available. So it's not accurate to say that the famine is right now. The famine's not here yet. You say, how do you know? Look at verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. A famine is not, well, um, we don't have apples, oranges, and carrots, but we do have um, beef and eggs and flour. No, a famine is there's no food available. All right? The famine of hearing the words of the Lord has not happened yet. You're listening to me right now. You can find me. All right? You can find other Bible-believing preachers out there. Now, I'll grant you, the new versions are very popular they're being pushed very hard by the seminaries. Um, and most of those seminaries are teaching that the original Christian church was Catholic. They're actually teaching that. Look it up. Ask them. All right? So 
there is a thing of the new versions being there to replace the King James Bible, these Vatican versions, in other words, that have come in. And again, you can look at the Second Vatican Council. I have it right here. And in this book, let me just show you. I think I have the page right here. Uh, yeah, it says here, page 112 of the Second Vatican Council. But since the Word of God must be readily available at all times, the church with motherly concern sees to it that suitable and correct translations are made into various languages, especially from the original texts of the sacred books. If, when the opportunity presents itself and the authorities of the church agree, these translations are made jointly with churches separated from us, they can then be used by all Christians. Let me see if I can show this thing on camera. I've showed this in my, my video, the real Bible version is to expose, but you can see it right there. Pause it and read it. All right. This is a Roman Catholic book, the Second Vatican Council. This is not a conspiracy book or something that's condemning and anti-Catholic and whatever else. This is their own material. And they're saying that they're going to make translations with churches that are separated from the Vatican. Protestants, in other words. Which is exactly what happened in 1881. I actually have... Let me show this real quick. See if I can find this thing here quick. Uh, where is it at? Okay, there we go. Um, right here I actually have, this is an original edition of the 1881 revised version put out by Brookfoss Westcott. And there was other, other men involved in the translation committee, but this is an original copy. This is the real deal right here. Revised version of 1881. You can see it right there. There's a lot of preachers that push the new versions that don't even have one of these. All right. Again, let me hold it this way. You can see it right there. Right there. And uh, over here, I have the American Standard Version, known today as the New American Standard Version. You can see it, right? This is not a 1901. This is a little bit later edition. I think it's a 1923, if I remember correctly. Let me just check real quick here. Nineteen twenty nine, okay, by Thomas Nelson and Sons, the Roman Catholic book publisher. All right there you go. Nineteen twenty nine, original copyright nineteen oh one. So there you go. I do know what I'm talking about. A lot of people seem to question that and they say, Oh, you know, I don't know, you're a conspiracy guy or whatever. Um I have the original source documents. I'll show you one more thing here in case you're not totally convinced. Right here, I have a Nestle's 27th edition. The text, the Westcott and Hort text made from the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus uh, codices there. It became known later on as the Nestle Aland text. Originally, Eberhard Nestle made some editions of that Westcott and Hort text. Later on, um, Kurt Aland, a German, came along and he uh, basically took over for Eberhard Nessel. Eberhard Nessel is also German. And they came out with later editions of this uh, Westcott and Hort text. So just as with the Texas Receptus, which is right, uh, right here, here you have the Texas Receptus. This one here, there were different 
uh, additions made, Erasmus and then Stephanus, Beza, uh, uh, L. Zever brothers, I think, they made different editions of this, received text here, based on the majority of manuscripts. This right here is the almost newest edition of the Westcott and Hort text, the Alexandrian type text. Here's the latest one. There's a paper fell on the floor. 28th edition. But the 27th edition has something in the front of it, in the preface to it, that you need to see. Again, I've showed this thing many times, but a lot of you might be brand new to this, so I'll just read it one more time. Page 45 of the introduction. Right here, I'll show it close up in just a minute. It says, the text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. The Vatican, in other words. Let me show you. Right there it is. Okay, if you can see that. So, the enemy of Bible-believing Christians down through the centuries, the Vatican, they were the ones that uh, released this false text. They were the ones with the revised version and any Bible today, the ESV, the New American Standard Version, New King James Version is a blending of received text and Nestle's type of readings. It's not a New King James Version um, as far as it has no connection to the King James Bible. Um, that's why we make such a big deal of it. King James onlyism, quote unquote, is a derogatory term against those of us who hold to the Word of God in the King James Bible. Um, very big study. And you can definitely look into it, and I recommend that. But uh, the whole point is, we still have the Word of God, the King James Version, that does not go back to the Vatican. Um, again, you know, there's another thing I need to address here, and they'll say that, well, Erasmus was a Roman Catholic, and he never left the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, well, that's true, but show me one time that the Catholics have ever used Erasmus's text or any edition of the Textus Receptus to translate a Bible. They don't. They don't dare use Erasmus's text. So people will, from the New Version side will try to come out and say, well, Erasmus was a Catholic, so see, the King James Bible is a Catholic translation. Funny, too, because Erasmus died nearly 100 years before the King James translation was written. So it's kind of weird. But uh, not quite a hundred years, but uh, you know what I'm saying here. But my point is, it's very important that I say that because, again, a lot of people are new to the Bible version issue. And I need to clarify what it's all about. Um, the famine has not happened yet. You can still hear the Word of God. You can still find it out. Within minutes, you hear King James Version, you can Google it or do a search on YouTube or whatever else, and you will find a myriad of, of preaching you can learn more online than you can attending any church building out there. If you go for 100 years, you can learn more in a week uh, from King, you know, King James Bible believers online than you could in 100 years at some church building someplace. All right? So the famine is not today. It's not here right now. You don't have to wonder from, you know, as it says there in verse 12, from sea to sea, from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. That's not true yet. But when does it come in? And does this give us a clue as to the timing of what people would call the rapture, properly called the catching away before the time of Jacob's trouble? Does it give us a clue? Well, let's think about a few things. Verse 11, here in Amos chapter 8. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Hearing the words of the Lord. Can you think of a New Testament tie-in if you're familiar with Scripture? Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The just shall live by faith, you see. We are saved by grace through faith. Hearing the word of God, you know, produces salvation. Can you still get saved today? Can you still hear the word of God today? Yes, you can. Turn to 
Turn to Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to give you my ideas on this whole thing here. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. Here you have verses 4 down through verse 8. You have the 12,000 uh, Jews from each of the 12 tribes, 144,000 in total, that are sealed in the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, and that's another interesting study. I'll be coming out with more on that in the future. But this is into the time of Jacob's trouble. All right. Let's look about this. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and stood uh, and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving on and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. All right. Now, a lot of people would look at this. They'd say, well, there's a great multitude there, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. So that's obviously Christians. Okay. Not so. Let me show you why. Look at verse... Um, 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Now, if they're Christians, we're going to find that out in the next few verses. Let's look about this. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You say, well, see, Christians go into the great tribulation. This is proof positive. These people came out of great tribulation. They've washed their robes. Well, let me point out two very important facts. Number one, the time period that's coming is called the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, the time of Israel's trouble. It's about the nation of Israel and the fact that they've rejected their Messiah. That's why the revelation of Jesus Christ has to happen for the nation of Israel. They see signs to confirm the New Testament that they don't currently believe in. We don't, the church does not need to have Jesus Christ revealed to us. That already happened at salvation. All right? There is no passage of Scripture in the King James Bible that uses the term the Great Tribulation for, as a title for the coming seven-year time period that's, that's in the future with the Antichrist and all the events of Revelation happening. That is an unscriptural term, the Great Tribulation. Right? This is the description. They've come out of Great Tribulation. In other words, great trouble, great, great horrible, bad things that have happened on the earth. They've come out of that. The title is called by two names. Daniel's 70th week in Daniel chapter 9. It's mentioned there. And Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 says the time of Jacob's trouble. And you look at both passages, it's clearly for the Jews, the nation of Israel. Again, just a simple basic understanding of Scripture. You can look and say, why would the church have to go into a time to be further purified. Aren't our sins paid for by Jesus Christ? Didn't His blood wash away our sins? Which brings me to the second point there. Notice it says, verse 14, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes. Wait a second. I thought a Christian is washed in the blood of the Lamb. I don't have to wash my robes. You see, there's an element of works involved in the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Can't take the mark of the beast. And we're going to see here in just a couple minutes, you will, there's also going to be a huge amount of people that are martyred for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, certainly there have been Christians martyred in the past. I understand that. But it's not going to be on the level as it is in the future. I mean, there were Christians in the past. You look at some of the, the Fox's Book of Martyrs and some of the stories there. There were Christians that were told they were being tortured and they were told, recant and we'll stop the torturing. They recanted and, you know, basically submitted to the Roman Catholic Inquisitors. And later on, their conscience bothered them and they came back and said, I renounce my recantation. Salvation is by grace through faith. 
and I reject the mass. And they were later put to death as a result. It's not going to be that way in the time of Jacob's trouble. In the time of Jacob's trouble, if you take the mark of the beast, there isn't going to be any kind of a thing later on where you get to say, oh, wait, I, hmm, I, I changed my mind. And there's a heretic out there right now that I heard of that's saying that you can cut off your hand or pluck out your eye or whatever else, and that gets rid of the mark of the beast. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. There's not, you're not going to find any of that in the book of Revelation. All right. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, you look at that. It says, if any man take the mark, he gets God's wrath. He gets God's judgment. Read the verses for yourself. There isn't going to be any kind of a, well, you can take the mark, but later change your mind. No, 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 no. That's why these saints in the time of Jacob's trouble there, according to verse 14, they're washing their own robes. That's not the case for a Christian. A Christian is washed in the blood of the Lamb. We have our sins washed away. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when God saves you, your sins are completely washed away. So do not be confused by that. Verse 15, Revelation chapter 7, verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That is true for the time of Jacob's trouble, saints. Well, let's look at uh, chapter 6. You might even have it right on the other page there. Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Let's see what happens here. What happens with these saints? Why is there a great multitude up there? It's very interesting here. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Huh. A future fulfillment of, this is a prophecy for the future where people are dying for the word of God. And yet the vast majority of professing Christians today do not believe the word of God exists. They'll say in the original autographs, the word of God existed in the original autographs, completely out of their minds. They don't even know what they're saying. They're repeating lies that they have been taught by their seminary you know, trained preacher who was taught by his professors the same lies that they've been led to believe. It's It's been a thing that's happened ever since this you know, corrupt text from 1881. The Vatican text over here was introduced into the Christian church. And they have been taught for centuries, well, I shouldn't say centuries, but for over 100 years, People have been taught that only the original autographs were inspired. Which is funny because no book ever existed that looked like this or anything even like it that contained all of the original autographs. So by their own admission, they are saying the Word of God in a perfect form never existed in one volume. So that by the vast majority of professing Christianity out there, they are saying the Bible in perfect form never existed. That's what they're saying. And they call that orthodox now. And they call people like me a King James only cultist. Isn't that funny? I'm a cult, you know, member or leader, some would say, because I hold this King James Bible up and say this is God's book. That makes me cultic. I would be better off saying that I believe in a book that never existed. The original autographs, which never existed in one volume. It's funny, isn't it? But... If that's true, if it's true that only the original autographs were inspired, only the original autographs could rightly be called God's Word, then why are people dying in the future for the Word of God? Interesting. The Word of God exists in a perfect form, and I hold it in my hands, this King James Bible. Look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Hmm. White robes were given unto them. They are martyred for the word of God there and for the testimony which they held, verse 9, they get a white robe for doing that. Hmm. They washed their 
robes in the blood of the Lamb. You understand? You see the tie-in? Verse 9, they get, they're slain for the word of God and the testimony which they hold. Okay, white robes are given to them. In verse 11, you go to chapter 7, verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Hmm. How interesting. It all ties together. You say, well, what about Christians? What about the body of Christ? Christians are there before the first seal is opened. If you look back at chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. That's the body of Christ. Look at it. And they sung a new song, speaking of the 24 elders, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It's not talking about 12 Jews, 12 Jewish apostles, 12 Jewish, uh, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes. It's not what it's talking about. They're all Jews. It's uh, two, you know, basically there from each of the 12 boundaries that God established back in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. You can read that on your own time there. Verse 10, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You say, well, that's only 24. How could that be the body of Christ? Keep reading. Verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. All right? So, a number less than 200 million, essentially. That's the body of Christ. We are as the angels of God in the resurrection. Jesus Christ talked about that. Um, and there's a lot more scriptures. I can't get into it in this study. I've talked about it in other sermons. But the whole point is, the body of Christ is there before the first seal is opened. After the first seal is opened, you get into chapter 6, and it goes down through there, verses 9 through 11. You have people in that time of Jacob's trouble. And they're dying for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're washing their own robes. Hmm. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, by the way, says that there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. There's a lot more to the verse, but that's the basic of the thing there. And yet, Revelation chapter 7, you have 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes, 144,000, in other words, Jews, and then verses 9 down through 17, it's talking about Gentiles. But I thought we're all one in Christ Jesus, you see. No, we're one in Christ Jesus right now in the body of Christ. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, it's coming, there's a separation. Why? Because God is now done dealing with, he's making a full end of all nations, whether he's scattered, whither he's scattered the Jews and he's saying, okay, I'm, I'm ending the Gentiles. The time of the Gentiles is complete. And now I'm coming back and focusing back on Israel again. Right now, Israel is blinded, according to Romans chapter 11. See, there's a lot more study here than people want to do. That's the whole thing. And it's a lot easier to just be sloppy and be non-dispensational and just run to Matthew chapter 24 and say, this is about the church. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, well, this is here and we're going to see the Antichrist and everything else. You can be a slob in your Bible interpretation, or you can actually study the Word of God. It might take you a few years and understand the deep things of Scripture. That's what's going on here. So, it's available right now. That's the whole point. Teaching and preaching of the Word of God is available right now. You can hear the Word of God right now. You're hearing it right now. Compare these things. Get a King James Bible for yourself and look these scriptures up. Follow along in your King James Bible. The famine's not here yet. But how do we go from right now, all these people using these new versions, and I have a whole bunch of them down here, but the new version's based on the Nestle's text. How do we go from this and people saying, I mean, can, you know, the average modern Christian, do you think that they're going to die for the Word of God? Of course not. What happens? How do you go from having these lukewarm people that really don't care in churches about entertainment and they just want to go and have a good time and get along with people. And you go from that to all of a sudden they're so fervent that they're willing to die for the Word of God. What happens? I believe that that's the rapture. The catching away of the body of Christ.
You can turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I said we're going to go there. Let's go over there and we'll look at some other things here quickly. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. It says here, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Um, there are people in modern churches, uh, and I say churches if you're not familiar with this ministry, um, churches in the New Testament are groups of people. They are never references to buildings. And yet today we have all these buildings. Where they come from? Roman Catholicism, again, um, as a whole other big issue. But the point is, there are people in these modern churches out there who, it's not that they take pleasure in unrighteousness. A lot of these people are deceived. I was raised in the modern church system. For 25 years, I used new versions. I'm 42 years old now. 25 years of my life, over half of my life. You know, obviously I wasn't reading the Bible much as a two-year-old or something, but the point is, uh, my first Bible was a New American Standard Version. After that, I got an NIV, All right? Up till I was 25 years old, I was a false convert, a false professing modern Christian. And I was a fairly moral guy. I still did some things. I still was wicked and whatever else, but I didn't hate God. I didn't, I didn't uh, you know, understand the Bible version issue? I had no idea. But here's the whole thing. How many people out there right now do not know anything about the Bible version issue? And they think in their mind, I'm hearing God's word. I'm doing my church, going to church thing. I'm trying to be a moral person. I'm trying to be a good person and whatever else. And when the rapture happens, boom, all of a sudden they're going to realize something they're not genuinely saved. Had the Lord caught the body of Christ up in the year 2000, like a lot of people were thinking, a lot of prophecy teachers were saying, the rapture is going to be in the year 2000. Had that happened, I wouldn't have gone up. As a professing Christian, I was not a real convert. I didn't understand the thing of biblical repentance. Coming to the end of myself, a broken, contrite spirit, and the change that follows a genuine conversion. I had no idea about any of that stuff. I was a false professing Christian. And had the Lord said, come up hither, I would have been one of the ones that was left behind. And here's the point. When the rapture actually does happen, what are the vast majority of people going to think that are left behind? They're going to realize what true salvation is all about. They're going to realize what the real Word of God is all about. And I think two things are going to happen there. Number one, right now, the Vatican, you go way back to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation years of the 16th century. Right? It goes back a little bit before then. You could go back to the 14th century with John Wycliffe. You could go back to then and say, you know, they say he was the morning star of the Reformation and he started to kind of put some doubts in people's minds about the Catholic authority in the Mass. And, and, you know, he was trying to get the scriptures to the people and, you know, make his own English translation. He used the Latin Vulgate of the Catholic Church, so it wasn't the best translation. But the point is, up until that time, for probably over a thousand years, nobody had access to the Word of God. Uh, I should say the vast majority. There were some groups of Christians out there. Uh, that the Catholics have called heretics down through the years. The Waldensian people were one of the better known groups. They had their own editions of Scripture, okay, that were based on the correct text. Greek Orthodox as well also had what today is, you know, known as the Texas Receptus. They had a lot of those manuscripts. So, But the point is, the Protestant Reformation really got underway in the 16th century. Luther, Tyndale, a lot of those guys, John Knox, a lot of them, were the ones that were getting, you know, bringing out these things that they were protesting abuses of Rome, the Catholic Church, and they sought to reform the Catholic Church, right? And so at that time, this was becoming a big thing. In the 1540s, uh, Ignatius de Loyola, and that's the correct way to say it, by the way, too, he was Spanish, 
So it's not Ignatius, it's Ignatius. I get people making fun of me for that. It's Ignatius, whatever. But the whole point is, he came out, founded the Jesuit order, and they began the Counter-Reformation. The end goal of the Counter-Reformation was to get all the heretical sects of Protestants eventually back under the Roman Catholic control. What did we re read earlier? The Second Vatican Council. Let's make translations with churches separated from us so that they can be used by all the faithful. The Vatican has never recommended the King James Bible and they never will. Why? Let me show you one of the reasons why. I'll show you one of the things that the translators wrote here. So that if on the one side we shall be traduced by popish persons at home or abroad. All right. Another place here, it says that this translation here, um, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. The translators to the reader, right there in the preface. I'm not going to take time to show it. You can look that up. But the translators of the King James Bible called the Pope the man of sin. They also talked about popish persons. So the Vatican has never recommended the King James Bible. And like I said, they never will. Never going to happen. All right. But this new version stuff that they've come out with, it's all part of the Calvin Reformation. And one of the translators, by the way, uh, of the one of the guys on the board of editors here of the Nestle's text is Carlo M. Martini. Right there. I should probably show this. Um, right there you can see his name. Carlo Martini. And Carlo Martini was a Jesuit cardinal. So the Jesuits that came out with their counter-reformation, they were the ones that said we need to bring back all people under the realm of Roman Catholicism. And that's exactly what has happened. Most of the major Protestant denominations have signed agreements with the Vatican to bring themselves back under the control of the Vatican. The Lutherans did it back in the 1990s, I think 1991. Uh, most of the others, the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and most of them have signed agreements. Um, most of them have submitted themselves to the Vatican. There's only a very small remnant of Christians that have not gone back under the authority of Rome. I am part of that number, and I never will go back under the authority of Rome. I would rather die than do that. All right? Now, right now, I'm considered radical. You see? Right now, we are a cult. We are King James only, onlyism cult members. But guess what happens when the rapture hits? And all of a sudden, those of us that hold to the true word of God for the English-speaking people, we leave. People are going to get real fervent, real fervent for the King James Bible. And I, like I said, two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to have the Vatican, because they're trying so hard to eliminate the heretics. They always have. And they're going to say, see, this is what happens. This, they're not going to call it the rapture. They'll just say it was some kind of a, we all killed ourselves or committed suicide. All of us King James only cult people, because we always complain about the condition of the world. We're not happy. We're mentally ill, all this other stuff. And they're going to say that we committed a mass suicide, took all the children with us and whatever else. And so we have to stop this. We have to put an end to it. And I was talking with some brethren about this. And one of them, uh, his name's Tim, brother and, and uh, brother Jeremy as well, did a live broadcast with this whole thing. But we were talking about it and he said they could make an algorithm that would go through the internet and basically shut down any Bible believing preacher. Hmm. Because when, what do you have whenever you see a shooting, a school shooting? The social media pages, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, the whatever YouTube channels of the shooter, the FBI or whoever else comes in and just goes boom and they shut it down right away. Well, guess what happens when the rapture hits? All King James only preaching. All the, those of us that hold to the King James Bible can instantly be turned off. In fact, they could even bring in Internet too. They talk about that. There's a whole other thing on that. Bring in a whole new Internet system that's going to be that much more control. But 
they'll bring it in under the pretense of this horrible thing happened, so we have to eliminate the heretics. You see, we can't let these heretical teachings come out there because look what horrible thing that they did. But now, here's the whole thing. That'll be the bad side of things. But those that are out there, the modern Christians, all of a sudden they're going to say, wait a second here, let's look at how things worked out. And they're going to start to realize that wasn't a terrorist attack, that wasn't a mass suicide, that was, that was the rapture. Guess what they're going to do? All of a sudden they're going to go from being very wishy-washy and not really caring what the Bible says to becoming extremely fervent. Let me prove my point. Let's do it in reverse. Let's just say you're out there, you're a conservative, Bible-believing Christian, whatever, and all of a sudden, middle of the night or whatever else, boom, there's this big explosion and you, you, this loud noise. And you, what on earth was that? And if you have small children, you run in to check on the children, they're gone. And you think, what on earth just happened here? What in the world's going on? And you, and you, and you, you hear sirens and you hear people screaming and you hear all this other stuff. And oh, what in the world? And you tune in and they say, oh, we're not sure what's going on. Children have disappeared from all over the world. And there's other people that have disappeared. We're trying to figure out what this was all about. And a little while later, they come on and they say, we finally figured it out. Joel Olstein and all of his followers have disappeared. And all the children there, along with them. Now, as a Bible-believing Christian, what would you have to, what conclusion would you have to come to at that point in time when you realize it was the rapture? You would have to convert to the teachings of Joel Olstein, wouldn't you? I know it's absurd, but just stick with me. I'm trying to prove a point here. If he disappeared and his following disappeared, the people that hold to the prosperity gospel, if they disappeared, there is no more option. There's no questions. There's no debate. It's over. You realize he was saved and his people were saved and I'm lost. And I have to become a fervent Joel Osteenite. <laughs> you know, of course, that's absurd. You know, we can, you can clearly see and debunk the guy from Scripture. But let's look at the reverse, the reality of it. The Joel Osteen types, the Rick Warren types, the whatever kind of modern, charismatic, Pentecostal, whatever, whoever out there. And all of a sudden, those King James Bible-believing Christians that everybody laughed at and made fun of and everything else, boom, they're gone. All of a sudden, you become very fervent. So what would happen? You would have, uh, go back to Amos chapter 8. Look at it. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. All of a sudden, the body of Christ leaves, and uh, that famine comes in. The... FBI or whoever else goes, we got to pull all this terrorist material off the internet. And they pull all the Bible believing stuff off the internet. And all of a sudden they start to say, we need to collect up these King James Bibles because this is the book that caused it. This is the horrible heretical book. The Vatican, the magisterium of the Vatican, they've never accepted this as a, as a proper translation of the Nestle's text. We got to gather these things up and burn them. Just like they burned Tyndale's translation centuries ago. Hmm. How about that? But there's another angle to this. Another thing that you need to think about. How much of church age doctrine do you think the Lord wants around for the time of Jacob's trouble? Those of us who hold to the biblical teaching of eternal security, once saved, always saved, as people say, understand that a person that gets saved is born again. They're the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to them. Do you think the Lord wants that around in the time of Jacob's trouble? No. Pauline epistles in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's instruction in righteousness there, but doctrine, you better be real careful. You're not sealed in that time of Jacob's trouble. The only people that are sealed in that time, read Revelation chapter 7, the only ones that are sealed are the 144,000. Nobody else has the seal of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus Christ's righteousness is not imputed to you in that time period. There's an element of works. They are washing their robes, remember? So you see, there's a thing there where the Vatican is going to come in and say, hey, we got to stop this King James only stuff. This stuff is what calls this horrible mass suicide and whatever else. But notice our text here, text here, Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the Lord God says, I will send a famine in the land of hearing the word of the Lord. God sends it. Why? There's a dispensational change. The body of Christ goes up, the dispensation changes. Every dispensation ends with a major event, as I talked about in my study on dispensationalism. Very interesting there. And it's rather ironic that uh, when you talk to lost people, you know what one of the number one things they'll say is? I've heard it many times out on the streets, going door to door, whatever else, witnessing to people and, and things. I've heard this things. I've seen it in the comments before I blocked the comments on my channel on YouTube here because it just got ridiculous. But I've seen this thing over and over again. Lost people will say, stop cramming your beliefs down my throat. Think about that. If I cram something down your throat, what is it that I'm cramming down there? Food. God's going to send a uh, famine in the land? Isn't it interesting that these wicked people that hate the gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't it interesting that they're actually prophesying their own future? Don't cram your beliefs down my throat. Okay? Then the bread of life, the water of life, the Bible's called both, will be gone. You won't be able to have access to it. And I believe early on, after the catching away of the body of Christ, the body of Christ goes up and all those people out there, those false professing Christians, all of a sudden, the argument is over. They're here. The body of Christ left. They were wrong. We were right. We've left. They're still here. And all of a sudden they realize, I have to believe exactly what those people believed that left. I have to become a King James Bible-believing Christian. Very interesting. And early on, there's going to be a lot of people and they're going to come out and they're going to say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. You mean you side with those people that did this horrible thing, this mass suicide, this terrorist attack, whatever they're going to call it? You mean you side with those people? How dare you? We're going to put you to death. And the people are going to say, go ahead. I will die for Jesus Christ. I will die for this King James Bible. And there were stories back in the past of early Christians when the Bible was first being translated, you know, the, the Tyndale and things. They would use a lot of times Tyndale's New Testament to start the fire that burned these Christians at the stake. Could it be that that's going to be in the future again? They're going to round up these King James Bibles and burn them in mass. I mean, a lot of them, in other words. Maybe at the mass, too, with a Catholic thing, but... You know, interesting because Hollywood came out with a movie years ago and a buddy showed it to me and he said, check this out. I think they're trying to kind of give a little bit of a pre-programming of what's going to happen, you know, predictive programming in other words. And it was called The Book of Eli. had uh, Denzel Washington, I think, in it years ago. I'm not recommending you watch the movie. Please don't watch the movie. It's Hollywood stuff. It's garbage. But the whole thing is, the whole um, thought of this movie was this guy was going around and he had the last King James Bible. I kid you not. That's what was in the movie. He had the last King James Bible. And everybody wanted it. And he said, after this event happened that ripped a hole in the sky and everything else, and everything went to pieces after that, they burned up all of these Bibles. The King James Bible. Why would Hollywood make a movie saying that there's coming a time in the future when a major event happens, a hole is ripped in the sky, and all of a sudden they're burning all of the King James Bibles. He didn't say the ESV and the NIV and the New American Standard. King James Bibles. Why? It's old, it's archaic, nobody cares about the King James Bible anymore. Who cares? 
then why is Hollywood making a movie saying that there's going to come a time in the future when this book is going to be burned? And what will happen after it's burned, after it's gathered up and burned? The people that stand for the King James Bible, the people that realize I didn't get raptured because I wasn't truly saved. They die for their faith. You see? Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. They're the ones, the great multitude that shows up in Revelation chapter 7. Early on, you see? And these Bibles are gathered up. What's going to happen afterwards? Amos chapter, 11, or Amos chapter 8, verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. It starts out, they're not going to hear the word of the Lord. The Lord sends the famine. So the word, hearing the word of the Lord is wiped out online. And interesting too, let me just say this. It starts out that way and it ends up that you can't even find the word of God at all. All the copies are gathered up and burned. Hmm. But let me say this. You say, well, I don't agree with this. Okay. Let's just say Internet 2 is kicked in before the rapture. And they ban all Bible-believing Christians. You know, there's all this talk about YouTube is hiring all these new people to censor conservative videos and things and whatever else. And they're going to stop uh, Bible-believing Christians from preaching the Word of God. Let's just say, for a minute, for sake of argument, let's just say that they come out and they totally ban all Bible-believing Christians from the Internet. Are you going to stop spreading the Word? Are you going to stop preaching the Word? My brethren out there that go out on the streets and preach, street preachers, are you going to stop? Are you going to stop handing out gospel tracts? Are you going to stop proclaiming the Word of God somehow? How can God send the famine of hearing the Word of the Lord unless the body of Christ is removed? There are those crazy people, King James Bible believing Christians like myself, I don't care what happens, I'm never going to quit preaching this book. So how then could God be sending a famine if all it is is just remove us from the internet or whatever else? I'll tell you what it is. The body of Christ is going to be leaving. And then you're not going to hear the word of God anymore. Because those that were truly saved have gone. They left. And those people that are left behind are going to say, you know what? If I can still get some materials or whatever else early on before it's totally banned, okay, and they'll be willing to die for it. I think that that's what's going to happen. And after this thing continues for a little while, there's not going to be any Christians left. Early on, people will be quite fervent because they're going to say, hey, my brother left. He used that King James Bible. I called him crazy. I made fun of him. I called it the King Jimmy Wimmy version. I made fun of that. I'm not making fun anymore. He left, I'm still here with my ESV. I'm still here with my NIV. My sister, my father, my mother, my son, my daughter, my brother-in-law, my mother-in-law, my father, my cousin, my co-worker, whatever. That crazy King James only nut that I used to know, they left and I stayed holding on to my new version. Two men at work. One, the modern professing Christian that's loved by his church members and has a good time, goes out, sees movies, goes out to, you know, whatever, worldly compromising person. The other guy's this radical nut King James only guy. They're off at some job together. The King James only guy has his King James Bible in his pocket, little pocket Bible, or maybe even he just carries the big one here like this. The other guy has his new version at home. He doesn't want to take it out or he's got it on his iPhone or something like this. And all of a sudden, boom, rapture happens. And the new version guy's sitting over there with his Vatican version, corrupt Alexandrian trash lation, <laughs> translation in other words. And he's sitting there and he blinks and he turns over and that crazy King James only cult member that was always trying to talk to him He's gone. And that guy looks over there and he sees that King James Bible. He's not going to hear the word of the Lord anymore from his saved buddy, saved co-worker, I should say. But that King James Bible is still available and that guy can take that thing and say, God forgive me. All these years I used these new versions. 
these new versions that come from the Vatican, the enemy of all Bible-believing Christians. I used them for all that time. I'll do whatever it takes. I will be willing to die for Jesus Christ and for the King James Bible or whatever the equivalent is in your language. Okay, understand that. I'll die for the book now. And early on, that's going to happen. And there's going to be a great multitude that gets saved early on. But that famine that God sends, those people get saved early on, and this King James Bible is going to be rounded up and burned in mass, and the people that stand by it are going to be killed. And when that time is over, then the true famine comes in. And they're going to look around, and people are going to be traveling around just like they did in the book of Eli, the movie, The Book of Eli. They're going to be traveling around trying to find just a copy of this book. Just anything. Anything. Could I just find a New Testament? Could I just find a tract with some King James, King James scriptures in it? And they're not going to find it. The famine happened. You better make sure that you're saved. Things are shaping up very quickly. I have no idea how long the body of Christ is going to be here. But uh, it's not going to be much longer. God's patience is wearing out with this world. And I'll tell you right now, I've talked about this in many studies. I've, just, I've been back and forth arguing with these people for years and years. There are three types of salvation that are being preached currently. And the one in the middle is the right one. Over here on this side, you have what's called Lordship Salvation, Works Salvation. You have to change your life before you get saved, and then you have to maintain good works to stay saved, or you prove that you were never saved to begin with. The Calvinists teach this a lot of times. It's a kind of sort of a hyper Calvinism thing. You change, you clean up your life, and then eventually God grants you repentance, and then you get saved. That's Lordship Salvation. On the other side of the spectrum, you have what's called easy believism. There is no repentance. It's just simply belief. And you, if you come out and you say, no, there's repentance, these people will say that you're lost. You say, but I believe in Jesus. Yes, but you say repentance, so you're, you're lost. Saying anything happens at salvation is anathema to the easy believism people. Nothing happens at salvation, just simply your belief. And these people continue in wickedness. They continue in things that the Bible condemns. And they just say, well, I'm a carnal Christian. Well, then, anybody who comes out and they say, I'm a sodomite. I go to a LGBT church. But I believe in Jesus. Well, they're saved according to the easy believers and people. Wicked people. There's all kinds of wicked people out there who say that they believe in Jesus. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe he saved me. Did he? No, true biblical salvation, the true biblical salvation that the King James Bible talks about is understanding that you're a sinner. Understanding that your self-righteousness is never going to get you into heaven. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can't get saved without this book, without an understanding of this book. I'll say it that way. You might find a tract or something like that or hear a gospel presentation and you don't know about the King James Bible, but I'll tell you what, you get saved when God saves you, He'll get you over to this book eventually. He will bring you to this King James Bible and say, this is my book, use it. And you'll gladly submit to this book. There will be a change. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Old hymn. Repentance. You're turning from your self-righteousness. You're turning from your church membership, from your baptism, from your Christian upbringing, from your conservative, Republican, whatever. You're turning from that and saying, that stuff can't save me. I'm not a good person. I'm a wicked person. Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is all that I have, all that I can call out to God. And you pray, you say, God, please save me. Please, I know I'm a sinner. I have no chance of getting into heaven. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible says.
And a lot of the easy believers and people, they go so far as to say that praying is wrong. It's a work. That's because they're lost and on their way to hell. And these are the people, the Lordship Salvationist, those that have to do perpetual works to maintain salvation. And the easy believers and crowd, those people that just simply say there is no changed life after salvation. You see, Lordship Salvation, as people say, change life before salvation. Easy believism say, no change after salvation. Neither one is correct. And both of those groups are going to find themselves left right here on the earth when the rapture happens. And they're going to look to the Bible-believing Christians like this ministry, like others out there that teach true salvation, repentance toward God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to look to those and say, they were the ones that were saved. I was wrong. They've left. I'm here. And now the famine comes in. The Bible-believing preachers, the Bible-believing Christians have gone. I'm not going to hear the word of the Lord anymore like that. And my only chance is quickly to put my faith in Jesus Christ genuinely and to believe this book and be willing to die for this book. That's going to be it. That's the only chance that these people are going to have. I pray, I hope and pray, that you find true salvation. Truly come to the Lord broken. Understanding that you've sinned before a holy, righteous God. Understanding that you don't want the old life anymore. You know, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you laboring with sin right now? Are you laboring and saying, I'm sick and tired of my life? I hate this world. I hate this life. I just wish something was real. That's the right attitude for salvation. Not saying, well, I'm just going to do this Jesus thing and hold on to the world and do whatever I feel like doing and just simply saying, well, I believe in Jesus so I can get both. That's not salvation. That is not salvation. You say, well, then I have to clean up myself and go to church and give up my alcohol, give up my pornography, give, you know, give lots of money to the church, <laughs> you know, and then, then I can eventually be saved. I'm proving my merit. That's not salvation either. Salvation is, it is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Paul says, of whom I am chief. Jesus Christ said, they that are whole will have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Biblical repentance will make a changed life after the Lord saves you. That's what it's all about. Jesus Christ will change your life. If you've never experienced that change in your life after salvation, then I can tell you you're not saved. Please, please, put aside all the stuff, your career, your family, your relationships, your friendships, everything. There's nothing in this world that is more important than you getting your salvation figured out. You coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I want to know for sure that I'm going at the catching away of the body of Christ. I don't want to be left here. I don't want to have to feel the terror in my stomach when all of a sudden I realize the rapture happened and I'm here on this earth. I didn't make it. Please get your salvation figured out. For 25 years of my life, 26 years actually, excuse me, 26 years of my life, I didn't know. I was a churchgoer. I was a lot cleaner than most people, but I was wicked. And I got it figured out. I pray that you do the same. Time is running out. 